Amen. So are you guys ready for the word? Yes. Yes, yes I am too. I am too. I got to tell you guys, you know, we've been talking about the light and the light brings illumination. Well, I, there's some more illumination that the light brought to me. I got to give to you guys. So uh, we're going to talk about a few things. Amen. And all of our teachings is to get you to a better place in God. I, did, I want to repeat that. All of our teachings is to get you to a better place in God. That means we're not trying to get you to a better place on your job. We're not trying to get you to a better place in your life or your career or your finances. Because if you got God, you got everything. He the one that opens up the doors. He knows where your promotion's coming from. He knows where your favor coming from. He knows who's holding your favor right now. He's just saying that until you get in alignment, you won't be able to see your favor. So for us to see his favors, to have the light of God come on our life, amen? So we're going to talk about uh, some things where the light is concerned. We talked about the light, and we taught on the light. And this past Wednesday, Pastor Brenda and, I'm sorry, yeah, Pastor Brenda and Minister uh, uh, Sandra did a phenomenal job on the teaching that they did on this past Wednesday. I want to invite you guys to go and look at it on YouTube or face well, YouTube actually, if you haven't had opportunity to see it. But... The light is all about God saying that Jesus was the light of the world to us. Then he said that I have made you the light to the world. He says that the light that I have in you cannot be extinguished. But you can't control your light if you go and hide your light. And many times our, 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 our light is being hidden not only because we are afraid to come out the closet, but also we are under a bunch of stuff. We are under the weights of life, the burdens of life, the discouragement of life, the, 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 the doubts that life brings our way. But he says that nobody lights a light and go put it underneath something, underneath a basket, right? He says, no, he says, when I light you up, I need for you to go and put that light in a room. That room is the space that you live in. That room is the space that you do life in. He says, once people see your light, then you begin to energize everybody in your space because of the light that's on your life. And can I tell you that that light that's on your life is peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you that the light that's on your life is how you do life. We can't do life any kind of way and expect to be the light. Some things distract the light from us because we get distracted by life itself. I want to talk to us uh, to, today on a subject matter called conviction. I want to talk to us today on a subject matter called, called conviction. Because when we are not convicted, we'll go in any direction because we're not convicted about the right direction. And oftentimes we teach about a lot of things when we come to church, but we don't teach you how to stay in the light of God's will for your life. We don't teach you how to live out the, in the light of God so that he can open up doors so you can see the doors that's already been freely opened to each, to every one of us. So we're talking about the subject matter called conviction. Conviction is a strong persuasion or belief. It's a strong persuasion or belief. Conviction is a belief that shapes your behavior. It's something you believe so strongly that it determines the way you act. Whatever you're convicted about, it determines the way you act. While an opinion is something you discuss or even argue about, a conviction is something you die for. You see, we can easily change that. We can easily have an opinion about this or that. 
you know, well, I don't see it like that. And we're living in a time where everybody, they're living according to their opinions and not convictions. The people who have made the greatest change in this world, for good or for bad, were not the smartest or the wealthiest. There were those with the deepest conviction that they actually believed what they were saying. That, that they just didn't go and, 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 and copyright somebody else's stuff, but they believed what they were saying. And when you believe what you're saying, you have the ability to affect change around you. What keeps somebody in a place for change when it seems like change is so far away, it's so hard, it's so challenging, but I'm convinced because I got a conviction that this is God's way for my life. Our society says every value is up for grabs. It says you can do whatever you want to do with no moral absolutes. You can live how you want to live. You can say how you want to say. You can do you without fear of consequences of how you're doing you with no convictions. But the truth is that if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. People, listen, you got very persuasive people that know how to sell a lie real good. And the Bible says that these individuals, has a, they have a father. And this father is called the father of lies. If the enemy is not good on anything else, he know how to paint a lie to make it look like it's true. He know how to paint a falsehood, a falsehood to make it look like it's facts, and it's not. But it's even, even possible to know, but is it even possible to know right from wrong in the day and age that we're living in? Because your conviction is what defines your character and your life and the blessing that is attached to your life. I don't think nobody want their blessings to be delayed. Nobody want their blessings. And oftentimes we're saying, well, you know, you're not denied, but you're delayed. Well, why am I delayed? Because sometimes it's not the timing of the Lord. Sometimes it's my positioning in the Lord. I'm not in right alignment. My convictions haven't got me in right alignment. Hebrews chapter 5, 14 says, but solid food is for the spiritual mature. Let me tell you what the spiritual mature part is talking about. It's not talking about your age. You could be spiritually mature at a young age. He's talking about are you mature on the inside to know right from wrong. He's talking about do you have some conviction. He said whose senses are trained by practice to distinguish between the moral good, morally good, and what is evil. I want to read that again because I want to pull something out. He says that the spiritual mature are those whose senses are trained by practice to distinguish between the moral good and what is evil. He says how you become spiritually mature, you got to practice being good. You got to practice being moral. When an issue come up, you got to say this is the right way, this is the wrong way. According to what? Not because of what you think is right or wrong, but what does God say is right or wrong? And if we don't know God's mind on the matter, how can we know what's right and wrong about your matter? And oftentimes we don't have no convictions about that. People who know the truth are the ones who feast on the solid food of God's Word. The Bible helps them know right from wrong. But can I tell you that the solid foods of God's Word, that's like eating broccoli. Spinach, you know, we don't want to eat the Brussels sprouts or the beets, you know, we, we don't want to eat the healthy stuff. We want the fried chicken, the fried pork chop, come on somebody. We want them red beans and rice, the white beans and rice, all the starch, all the fats, all the grease. You're a diabetic, but you got that chocolate cake in the refrigerator right now. You ain't got no conviction, no conviction. We do what feels good to the flesh. But we heard earlier that God is not a man, so he don't have a flesh. Well, we understand from the book of Genesis that he made us in his likeness and his image, but that's a spiritual likeness and that's a spiritual image. The only time he had a flesh was when he came down in the flesh in the form of Jesus. And even Jesus had to deny himself for 40 days and 40 nights. 
Uh, but, but if we don't have no denial power in our consciousness, because see, you get convicted from your consciousness. It's something, it's something about we know what's right and we know what's wrong. And so, I want to tell you that the enemy is nothing but a counterfeit. He ain't nothing but a counterfeit. Let me tell you something. I, I got, I got, I got, I bought something with me. It's something that we all hold value. Money. Money. I got $100. Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin. All, all of the numbers are there. It look right. It feels right. If I was a blind man, I'd say it feels like a hundred. <laughs> we put so much faith in the almighty dollar that we don't even check to see whether it's a counterfeit or not. We exchange money all the time from one hand to the other hand. If I put this money in your hand, I promise you, you ain't got a pen that can go across this $100 bill to say that it's fake or not. But when you take that money to a store that handles finances, that handles currency, you give them a bill a larger than a 20, a pen coming out. And the pen coming out, okay, good to go, it's good, okay. But in life, we have all kind of counterfeits that we don't even question. We don't even question. When the U.S. Treasury Agency are learning to distinguish real bills from counterfeit ones, they don't study the counterfeit. They study the actual printed money. They know their currency that they print in at the mint. They, 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 they look at what they print. They don't look at the counterfeit. They look at what they print, what they produce, and they know it so well that if a pass bill, if a bill gets passed and it's counterfeit, they're able to detect it easily and quickly. Why? Because they look at it and they say, that's not my product. We didn't produce that. Mm -mm. We can't take that. That ain't got no value on it. I don't care if it got $100 on it. It ain't got no value to it. And sometimes as Christians, as Christians, God is looking at us, he says, that's not my image. That's not my image. That's not my, that's not my likeness. It don't feel right. There's no value in this. And, 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 but yet you're offering that to me, but when I put my pen on it, it don't come out like it should come out. Now, we're not talking about perfection on this morning. Because none of us are perfected. He, but we are talking about purity. They spend their time studying the real bills. Then when the counterfeit comes along, the agents recognize that those counterfeits, counterfeits aren't real. It's like when you done seen the real deal, when you done had the real deal, you know when fake come. You know when fake come. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man. But the end of that way that seems right to that man or that woman of God is death. But it seemed right. It seemed like the thing to do. It seemed like the choice to make. It seemed like the person to marry. It seemed like the job to, it says it seems right to a man, to our perspective, how we see life. But the end of that, to the end of that thing is death, it says. Is it the same way with the truth, God's word? You don't have to know everything that's false. You just have to know the truth of the Bible. Then when fake comes around, the enemy won't be able to fake you out. And all the enemy does is present fake stuff to you all day long. And he tells you that this is good for you. This is right for you. But if you've been reading your word or hearing your word, however you get the word, you've been getting enough of the word to know that, no, this is fake. This is fake. And none of us want to be fake, and we don't want fake friends. Listen, I know y'all being quiet, but that's okay. 
This is not one of them jumping and shouting messages. Be still and know that I am the Lord. I'm talking about him. <laughs> That's okay. Just be still and take it. Take, get your medicine, baby. Get your medicine. Get your, every time, it ain't time for the jumping and shouting right now. Sometimes we just got to sit and receive. And I'm telling you right now that nobody like fake. You don't like fake. You don't like fake friends. You don't like imitation. You like the real deal, concentrated from the real fruits, right? I don't like no imitation flavor. I don't like no imitation believer. I don't like no imitation friend. If you're a friend, be a real friend. Be a friend in my good times and my bad times. Be a friend when I'm in my valley. Be a friend when I'm on the mountaintop. Be a friend when I, listen, when I totally blew it, be a friend. Be a friend. Don't be a fair weather friend. Don't be fake and phony. Be authentic, be genuine. Tell your neighbor I'm authentic and I'm genuine. Now, I know some of y'all had a hard time with that, but that's okay. We call those things that be not as though they are. Amen. But from this day forward, that is my declaration because I got some conviction. I got some conviction. I got some conviction. As you get to know the truth, you develop a conviction. You share God's values. You get a heart for God by developing convictions. And you develop convictions by getting to know God's word. That's the only way you develop convictions is by getting to know his word. To know it because his word is his mind and his mind is his word. Your faith is what you believe to be true. Your faith represents your conviction. Whatever you believe to be true, your faith gonna follow. Be it good, bad, or indifferent. Hebrews chapter 11 verse one says this here. To two. It says, now faith is the assurance, the title deed, the confirmation of things hoped for. I've been hoping for some stuff. I've been believing for some things. For divinely guaranteed and the evidence of things not seen. Now, the things I've been hoping for, the things I got faith in, I haven't naturally seen it yet. The conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. For by this kind of faith, the men of old gain divine approval. What the word is saying here is that you believing for some things in your mind, in your heart. And I'm talking about convictions right now. I'm not talking about materialism right now. I'm talking about straight up Holy Ghost conviction. That you got to believe what you say and say what you believe. I ain't talking about you believing for somebody else saying. I'm talking about believing for what you said, what you see, according to the Word of God. He says, when a man got this kind of faith, though I haven't showed him anything tangible yet, though nothing has manifested yet, he believed my word, he take me at my word. This is the faith we're talking about. The faith that created the world, the Bible says. That when God spoke, the world became in existence. The Bible says they had men that took God at his word. That even though it hadn't come to pass yet, but God put a knowing on the inside of them that if you trust me with this, I'm going to bring it to pass. Can I tell you that when you got that conviction that I know, that I know, that I know, nobody can uh, uh, dissuade me for what I know. Nobody can talk me out of my, my, my beliefs. Nobody can talk me out of my convictions. No, this ain't right. This is right. Why do I need conviction? Why do I need it? Conviction is like, you know, if you pinch yourself you're going to, hard enough, you're going to feel something. Conviction serves us the same way. When I'm convicted, man, I got to get this thing right. I'm just convicted. I got to get it right. But what's in your heart convicting you that is wrong? If you don't have nothing in your heart convicting you that what I did, how I'm living, what I'm saying, I'm convicted by that. I got to get my life better than this here. I got to stop going off. I got to stop being salty. I got to stop being negative nearly, amen? I got to stop being evil in some of the things that I do. I got to have a conviction that this just don't feel right to me. 
So uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy verse 3, 16, it says, all scripture, somebody say scripture, we're talking about the Bible, we're talking about the Bible, all scripture is good, is God breathed. He breathed. When he breathed, he spoke, given by divine inspiration, and it is profitable. So I say, it's going to make me profitable. And it's profitable for instructions, for the conviction of sin. He says, when you get this word inside of you, and, and listen, some come at you, or you do in life, and, you, and you're off the mark, and you're not uh, 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 on point with your life. He said, there should be something inside you that tells you, I'm not on point in this area in my life. I need to get more on point. I need to get more, uh, 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 more right in this area of my life. Some, something got to get you right. Can I tell you that? Some Christians have a hard time forgiving. Even though they know that God says that we should forgive, they have a hard time forgiving. So it's not that we don't know. Sometimes we don't, just don't have enough want to. Uh, my desire to forgive is not big enough. But I'm telling you that God says you got to have something inside of you that, gives, that, that puts a conviction in you to tell you that I can't walk around with a hard heart. I can't walk around negative all the time. I can't be a victim in my mind all the time. Something inside of me got to change. I got to be convicted by what God's Word says about my life. So he tells Timothy, that all scriptures is, is God-breathed, given by divine inspiration, and is profitable for instructions, for conviction of sin, for correction, for correction of error and restoration to obedience. He says, when you read that word, you will be restored back to the place of obedience. He said, when you read this word, the next scripture says, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will. You and God got to live guess what? In agreement. We've been talking about living in agreement with one another. How about us just living in agreement with God? Let's just live in agreement with God's Word, what He says. I'm telling you that as the day grow darker, your light got to get brighter. And the only thing that makes your light brighter is the Word of God working in your life. You don't have no more time for excuses, baby. I'm telling you that it's getting dark out there. And if you don't live with conviction, how are you going to raise your, cat, your child up? The Bible says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they get old, they should not depart from how they was trained. But if you're not walking with a spirit of conviction, if they listen to your conversations and you don't think they're hearing your conversations, if they're seeing how you process life, how you make choices, how you make decisions, if they're watching your attitude about a thing, you're being an example whether you want to be in, well, I didn't intend for them to pick that up. They're picking everything up. And let me, let me tell you, let, let me just go here because I got some conviction on this morning. Let me just go here for a minute. Let me just go here for a minute. There have never been more time, like we are right now, that people need coaches and mentors and counselors to be coached through life to be mentored through life, to be encouraged through life. When I got my first home, my rent was $175. $175. You can't even find a shack for $175. But yet we expect to send our kids out for them to have a good, prosperous life, and they can't even afford the life that God's promising them because of the times we live in. If they don't know that God is their provider, that he can make a way out of no way. That he can open up doors. He can give you the finances you need. He know what a cow, listen, some of y'all don't know these scriptures, that's why I know the scriptures. He know where all the cattle on the hills is located at. He know where all your gold is at. There's some gold in that mountain and you don't know. He said, this is where your destiny is. This is where your purpose is. This is where, th listen, this is where all your resources gonna come from when you have some convictions about what I'm telling you right now. The Bible says that faith, 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 let me just read it. Let me just read. Oh, Lord, let me just, let me read this, baby. Thank God, I, you know, everybody didn't have Google. We didn't come up with Google. We came up with, you better memorize that Bible. I used to have a Bible with tabs on it. I graduated from my tabs because I said, Lord, I'm looking like a rookie up there. 
I'm looking like a rookie with these tabs. But, 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 but I want you to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We just got through reading this. But I, 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 want, I want to read you something from, from, a, from, a, uh, from a different version. But I want to show you some examples from the Word. Do you know that this is why this Bible was written? You, you know, we live off of quotes, inspirational quotes. I love inspirational quotes just like the next man. But those quotes don't have no life in it. Those quotes just, listen, they say, oh, that's a good saying. I like that. Let me repost that. Have you ever did that? Just repost as a quote? But can I tell you that the Word of God is alive. This Word is a live Word. It's an active Word. And when you take this Word and you believe what this Word says, it'll do wonders for your life. It'll do wonders for you. It'll do wonders for your headspace, for your marriage, for your, it'll do wonders for your life. But I want to share with you a few examples that the Bible talks about where these men of God was concerned who had to believe God for faith, by faith. And, and the Bible record, re, records them. It says uh, in 11, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, verse, verse 4, by faith. Somebody say, by faith. By faith. This was the vehicle, that, the vehicle that, that God used in these men's lives, faith. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was, commended, it was, he was commended as a righteous man. His faith made him a righteous man. What, why did he, he believe what God said? When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith he still speaks, even though he, he is dead. Yo, listen, the works that you do right now, even when you did, the Bible says God still going to be having people talk about your faith. If you've been living a life of faith, somebody going to live, somebody to be remembering you. Yeah, listen, all these houses over here, I'm, my, my head a little bit swole right now. Because he allowed me to live in the community that we revitalize. Faith, faith, faith made it happen. Look what it says. Look what it says. It says, verse 5, by faith, Enoch, that was, uh, was taken from, from life. Eli, Enoch was taken from life so that he did not experience death. This was a friend to God. God saw his life, and God said, I'm not going to let you die. I'm just going to take you. So that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. He pleased God with his life. And God says, I'm not going to let no sickness take you. I'm not going to let old age take you. I'm just going to take you, and you're going to be with me. And the Bible says in verse 6, and without faith, you ain't got no faith. It is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You want a reward? You want your, everybody got, everybody want a reward up in here. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Hands all, hands up. Let King, let God see you. Who want a reward up in here? Everybody want a reward. He said, if you want your reward, he says, number one, have faith that you believe that I exist. Even though you can't physically see me, you got to have faith that I am who I said I am. He said, and if you believe who I say I am, he said, then you're going to seek me. He said, you're going to seek me. But the Bible talks about, he said, don't just seek him. He said, seek him early. He says, why he may be found. So apparently there's a day or a time in our individual lives that when we seek in God, well, you didn't come early enough. I don't want that to be our story because we didn't have convictions. We didn't have convictions. We didn't have convictions. The power of your godly conviction develop your personal core values. When you have convictions, you start having core, core values. You say, what are these core values? You see, I came up in a time where they still had the, well, the beginning of the bro code. That was a value. That was a value. Brothers, y'all know what I'm talking about. Well, maybe you don't. Act like you don't. Whatever we did in them streets stayed in them streets. We didn't take the streets back to our house because we had a code among ourselves. We had a core value, and this became our conviction. We don't talk. We take it to the grave. This became our core convictions for, for how we live our life when we was in them streets. Now we come into the things of God. Now we got to have God's core convictions, kingdom convictions, core values. From these convictions, you develop your core values for life. You got to have a life blueprint for your life. God has a blueprint for your life. Can I get a good amen? God has a blueprint for your life. 
listen, listen. This will become your convictions. I'm convicted when my convictions are violated. When anybody come and violate my convictions, I feel like I'm violated. What's my core conviction? If anybody, one of my major core conviction is love. I train myself to love. I train myself to love unconditionally. You think it's easy to love unconditionally? You think it's easy to love people who despitefully use you and talk about you and gossip about you? But then God's word says, love those. Love those. Love those. That's training. You train yourself. The time we live in, no, you cut them off. We don't love, we cut them off. We cut them completely off. And I'm telling you that the Lord is saying you got to have some conviction where his word is concerned. Your personal conviction is what sets healthy boundaries around your life and your purpose. Healthy convictions. I'm not going to allow nobody to come into my space and violate my convictions. If you come in here hating on somebody in my space, my job is to shine the light of love on you. So you can know that just like you hating on somebody, at some point, at some point, Somebody was hating on you, and it didn't feel good to you. So why are you not loving your neighbors like yourself? It's a core conviction. It's a core conviction. Your conviction is tied to your protection, your provision, and your prosperity. Can I tell you right now that your conviction, whatever conviction that you have, according to the Word of God, is tied to your protection, your provision, and your prosperity. You got to have conviction. Now, let's talk about this for a moment. Let's talk about the difference between your personal conviction and God's conviction. Because we all have convictions about something. If you come upon me and you violate my conviction in this area of my life, then I'm, 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 you're violating me. But I'm talking about all of your conviction being defined by God's convictions for your life being defined by the Word of God. The Word of God becomes your filter that you put your life in and everything is funneled and filtered through your filter that when it comes here on the other side, God approve of that. He approve of this because of my conviction. Your personal conviction controls your do's and your don'ts. If I'm convicted about something, my personal conviction concern, it, it concerns my do's and my don'ts. It tells me what I am gonna do and what I'm not gonna do. This is outside of my convictions. I can't do that. This is going against my belief system. Have, have anybody ever asked you to do something that went against your belief system? And then something rose up on you. The thing that rose up on you was a conviction. That conviction said, I can't go, I can't do this. I can't do this. It's outside of my belief system. But when you don't have nothing to believe in, or when you don't know what to believe in, or when you believe in culture, when culture tells you, this is what we believe, everybody do what's right for them. You live your life, I live my life. And that's fine and that's good and that's dandy. But when it comes to God, we shouldn't be doing us. We should be doing him. Because can I tell you that what he says in his word is that it's in him that we move. We have our life and we have our very being in him. And, and the coaching up is that how do I become more like Christ? without being religious. I'm not trying to be religious, I'm just trying to have a relationship. And my relationship comes when I know his word for my life. When I know, when I know his conviction. His conviction becomes my conviction. If Jesus says, nah, that's not how we do in the kingdom. That's against the law in our kingdom. If it's against the law in the kingdom of God, it's against the law in my life. But we can't no longer live a life with no rules. When we live a life with no rules, we, let the, we give permission for the enemy to come in. Because he liked going to a house with no rules. A house with no rules means that a house ain't got no structure. A house with no rules means a house ain't got no walls. It's just all open for everybody to come in and out, drop all their mindset in, just dump on you. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We got boundaries around here. We got convictions around here. The Lazard family have a standard. We have a code of value around here. Amen? Your conviction is what gives you courage and boldness to do your life. Your conviction is what gives you courage and boldness to do your life. 
It is important that you have godly convictions so that you will know what is the perfect will of God for your life. Your conviction is what gives you courage. Nobody else may not say something, but you're going to stand up and say, no, flat-footed, not here. Uh-uh, this, this can't happen in my house. Uh-uh. I remember when my kids was growing up, we had a conviction. I was convicted that y'all should be in the house by 11 o'clock. If you come in the house after 11 o'clock, then there's some consequences. Well, Dad, I came in five, I didn't say that. I didn't say five after 11. I said 11 o'clock. Can I, live, can I tell you that we're living in a time where that's no longer happening? That's no longer happening? Well, baby, we're going to trust them. That's okay. We're going to trust them. But they're violating a conviction. They're violating a conviction. The Word of God is profitable for instructions for your life. The Word actually come, becomes your coach and your mentor. The Word becomes your coach and your mentor. The Word of God is the wisdom of God. The Word of God, you see, the Bible talks about, and the Holy Spirit says, there's going to come a time where you will need no teachers, that the Holy Spirit will teach you, that the Spirit of God inside of you will teach you. But then, but, but, but then we have to come and we have to be the mouthpiece of the Holy Spirit to get you to a place where you can approach the Word of God and the Holy Spirit can tell you that this is what this says about your situation. Because God got a perfect plan. He's all wisdom and all knowing. When we are convicted, it is the Holy Spirit way of letting us know we are out of God's will and we have broken relationship with the Father. That's what the conviction is. We are out of God's will, and we have broken relationship with the Father. And what, you, and what, what we're saying to, to the Father, Lord, I'm convicted in this area. I know I'm not right, but I want to get it right, Lord. The enemy comes in, and he wants to condemn. He want to make you think that he want, he want to make you think that you go to hell in the handbasket, and that's not what's happening. What's happening in your heart is that you become sensitive. You become sensitive. To say, you know what, I'm convicted that change has to come to me so it can come to my family. I must hear the Word of God. I must do what the Word of God says to do. The thing about, the thing about, uh, about wisdom is that it's so powerful. The Father's wisdom helps us gain godly knowledge and bridge and brings peace, protection, prosperity to our lives. Godly wisdom helps us gain godly knowledge and it brings peace, protection, and prosperity. His wisdom has great value. That's what makes the scriptures profitable to our life. His word working in our life. James 1, verse 5 and 8. James is telling the, the, the listeners and the hearers. James is saying, if any of you lacks wisdom. He said, I know you ain't got everything you need. He said, but if you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously. To all without reproach. He's not looking for you to qualify for the wisdom. He just asks you to come to me and it will be given to him. But let him ask. He said, but if you're going to come to me for wisdom, here's the key. He says, if you're going to come to me for wisdom, he says, let him ask in faith without doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from God, from the Lord. He is a double-minded, unstable in all his ways. He says that when you go to God, he says you have to believe that God will give you the wisdom you need for your life. And and the Bible says he's generous. He's going to give you as much as you want. The thing I like about God giving his wisdom is this here. Is that Solomon knew, he saw his father... He saw his father, David, King David, rule over the entire kingdom back in his day. And he saw how his father ruled. And Solomon went to God when his dad passed away. And Solomon asked God, he says, God, these great amount of people, you was with my father. And my father knew how to govern the country, how to govern your people. I don't have that wisdom. But yet now I got to step up. I got to step up and be what my father was to the people. But Lord, I come to you humbly asking 
Uh, with all humility, I ain't got the wisdom, Lord. I'm telling you, I ain't got that wisdom. He says, Lord, all I ask you for is the wisdom to lead your people. The Bible says that God was so honored with Solomon's request that God granted Solomon the wisdom that he wanted. But it wasn't man's wisdom. It was God's wisdom. Oftentimes, we're looking at man's knowledge, man's wisdom. There's a way that seemed right to a man, but the, way, but the, but the end of that is death. He said, you're not going to have a good outcome, though it look wise in the eyes of men. Do we go God's way or do we go man's way? And if you ain't got no conviction from God's word, when you hear his word, to say, you know what? I'm taking this word and I'm applying this word to my life. From now on, Lord, I'm going to work on not lying again. I'm not going to tell her, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work on not lying. Lord, I just don't want to lie no more. I got a conviction about not lying. Lord, I, I, I'm convicted I won't be lazy anymore, Lord. I'm convicted, Lord. I'm sorry, I apologize. I was lazy where your word was concerned. I was lazy where your will was concerned. I was lazy becoming a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not be lazy anymore. I'm convicted that I want to change. I'm convicted that I want to be the light. I'm convicted that when, when my family look at me, I want them to see God in me. I, I don't want them to see the stuff. I want them to see your nature inside of me. I want them to see your peace inside of me. I want them to see your joy inside. Even when all hell is breaking loose in my life, there's a peace that passes my understanding, and they can't understand. Why are you at peace? Well, I got a peace working inside of me. I've been working on my peace. I've been working on my joy. I've been working on my faith. I'm convicted that this is how God wants me to live. And I understand there's a real enemy that's trying to trip me up, trying to put things in my face, in my, in, in my face that's a counterfeit. And I got to be able to distinguish that's a fake. That's a fake. And sometimes we have a thirst, and the enemy will send us something to quench our thirst. Your thirst become a trap for the enemy. When God says, if you drink from my will, you will never thirst again. When I found that well, and that well is living inside of each and every one of us, y'all, there's a deep well, a well of life, that if you tap into that well of life, you will find a strength and a power and a light for everything that you will come across in life. And so he says, don't think that if you ask of me stuff, if you don't believe what you're asking me for, don't even come to me. He says, you don't believe what you're asking me for. Just, I just want you to believe. I want you to have a conviction about what you're asking me for. Oftentimes, we're looking for the outside to convict us. When I say convict us, to make us feel uncomfortable, that change should come, that it's time for a change. We're looking for external things to make us feel convicted. Can I tell you that you should be convicted from the inside? It shouldn't, you should, this should be, nobody should be responsible for your conviction. It shouldn't be that, well, you know, I just, I, I'm just not convicted. I hadn't heard nothing to make the, you hadn't heard nothing. The only voice you should be hearing is the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, this is the way to go. This is the way to go. That's the wrong way. This is the way to go. All of our convictions should come from the inside. What a nothing in, nothing out. No word in, no conviction out. They made a commercial some years ago called Got Milk. I, I, I want to put a twist on that. Got conviction? We all should want to feel. It's a, well, I just don't want to feel convicted. I just want to be happy. But it just takes just 10% of strychnine. And anything that you're doing, that's fun. That seems like it's fun. Do you know the Bible, how the Bible talks about sin? It says sin is death. But the Bible also says that sin is fun. What you going to do with the fun? Let's, let's be for real, for real. What you going to do with the fun? Everybody want to have fun. 
Why you hating on me? Because I want to have fun. Don't hate on me. I just have a little fun. I can wild out. I can do this. I can do that. But we don't read what the scripture says to the end of the sentence. That sin is fun for a season. And while and the enemy take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay. And the next thing you know, when you try to come out to get into the light, because I've been in the dark long enough, let me get into the light. Something holding you back. Now he got you into a web, and you don't know how to get out. And I'm telling you that, listen, I know that we don't like to hear about this sin talk. But if we don't hear about this sin talk, how will you ever get conviction? We, if we don't hear about this sin talk, you will never be convicted, and you think that God is good with everything that this world has given us. And the world has given us a lot to chew on. A lot. You say, Pastor, you want me to stop dancing? Girls, dance your best dance. Do your line dance. Do whatever you got to do. Maybe not the twerking part, but do the other stuff. You say, well, Pastor, why is it so important for us to get conviction? Because your children need conviction. Your children need convicted. You expected all this righteousness out of them, and you ain't walking right. It's unfair. The scale's not balanced. So judgment begins in the house first. And I'm convicted. I'm convicted that, guess what? I don't care if everybody leaves this church. I don't care. I don't care. All I, God said some news. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Y'all don't leave, y'all. Don't leave. Everybody need a good shower. Y'all take a good shower at the house to get the dirt off, right? Come to church, take a good shower. We ain't talking about this for a, a long period of time, but you got to stay in the shower long enough. Amen? My grandkids come to me every night, and they, they want me to smell underneath their arms, in their neck. They want me to know they smell good. They took a shower. God don't want us smelling like we've been playing outside. So, I want to close with this. The word, lets, the word lets you know when you're out of bounds is the word we believe that has the power to convict us of sin and make us sensitive. The word gives you instructions on how to make things right so we can be successful and be restored. The word teaches us how to overcome. The Word is what the Father used to train us to be more like Him in righteousness. It teaches us how to live a public and a private life of honor and integrity with moral courage. The Word teaches us that. The courage of your conviction. Let me tell you why I am so convinced. I read this Bible. I study this Bible. I live this Bible. I pick one thing. And I, I begin to work on it. It's like a muscle. Becoming like a muscle memory for me. But like, who's in your corner? Who's in your corner cheering you on? Telling you that this too will pass. Keep working it. Keep working on it. Keep working on it. Man, I, I did it again. That's okay. Get back up again. Get back up again. And sometimes you have those seasons like it's a knockout. One of my favorite movies to watch is Creed too. He got, so, he got too into himself. Pride came on him because he had won a championship. And he got away from the basics. He got away from his conviction. And when he got away from his basics and his conviction, he got into the ring for a fight. And he thought he had it. He was arrogant. He was cocky. He was, listen, he was here. Great confidence. I got this fight. But what he didn't know, his opponent had been looking at his boxing style, had been studying his opponent. And when he got into the ring, when he got into the ring, he lost the fight. He lost the fight. Sometimes we lose fights so we can go back and retrain again and retrain again. It doesn't mean you will never win a championship, but sometimes we lose. We get the, law, the Lord allowed the enemy to hit us for a reason, to catch our attention. And he said, hold on, wait a minute, I got to go back. I got I to retrain again. I thought I was strong in this area. What happened to my conviction? The next thing you know, the real rocket shows up. 
because now he got somebody in his corner who know how to win championships. He left the glitz and the glamour of the gym that he was in. He went out to the fields, to the desert. He went back to his first love and started training with some integrity. Start training like I'm about, to, I'm, about to, I'm about to go into this fight, but I respect my opponent. The enemy don't have no power over you other than the power you give him. The Bible says that he is a defeated foe. And, and, and the end of his days is in the lake of fire forever. But until that day come, you got to fight this enemy. And you gotta, he's going to always be putting stuff in front of you. And if he can keep you in your pain and keep you compromising and living a compromising life, then you will never build up your conviction to live the life God planned for you to live. Individuals come to my mind like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. People who had strong conviction in the Bible. People who I pattern my life after. Even when the king says that, listen, you got to bow down to my image. And those three Hebrew boys says, I am not bound down to no graven image. It's against my conviction. It, he, he said, well, you're going to be sentenced to death. Put them in the pit of fire. I love them boys because they give us an example of what true conviction look like. They say, well, my God is well able to deliver. But even if he don't deliver, I'm not going to cave in. I'm not going to cave in. I'm not going to betray my convictions. I'm not going to betray what I know to be true. Their conviction put them in the fire. And I want to tell you that sometimes your conviction will put you right in the fire without knowing whether God is going to deliver you or not. And the Bible says they went in totally persuaded because that's what conviction is. I'm persuaded that he is well able, but even if he don't, I'm not selling out. I'm not caving in. I'm not buckling under. I'm going to do what the Word says. I'm going to do what my training told me to do. Trust God with all your heart, all your might, all your understanding. Lean not to your own understanding, knowing that he will make a way of escape. The Bible says in, that, in the rest of that story that the Lord saw their conviction and he went down in the fire with them. I like a God who know how to come down in my fire, who, who could come down in my troubles, who could come down in my tests. I like a father like that. But he says, listen, I've watched your life. I've watched your life. You don't let people talk you into stuff. You know right from wrong according to my word. Conviction, conviction. The Bible talks about another Hebrew boy named Daniel. The king didn't want Daniel. It's, uh, the enemy got something against you praying. It's something about when you pray, when the, when the mouth of a believer opens up and starts praying with faith, trusting God that, God, you hear the petition of my heart. And I believe what I'm petitioning you for because I went to your word and I found out that your promises are true and yes and amen. And I found one of your promises for my life, Lord. And I'm praying your word over my life. I'm praying your word over my husband. I'm praying your word over my wife. I'm praying your word over my kids. I'm praying your word over my family, Lord. I'm praying your word over my community, Lord. I'm praying, Lord. I'm praying, Lord. I'm, my petition is going up before you, Lord. I got conviction, Lord. I know we can be better. I know we can do better, Lord. The Bible says that Daniel was threatened by the king that if you don't stop praying, then we're going to put you in the lion's den and we're going to, you're going to be some lion's food. Daniel said, it's my conviction. It's my conviction. I got to do how I've been trained up, what I believe. Do you believe God is a savior? Do you believe God is a redeemer? Do you believe God is a restorer? Do you believe God is a reconciler? He's all these things and much more. And the Bible says that Daniel got thrown in the lion's den. Sometimes we got lions in our life, y'all. They ain't going nowhere. They there. But God knows how to close the mouth of the lion. He knows how to close the mouth of the lion. He don't have no appetite for you. Though he show up like a roaring lion, he don't have no appetite for you. It's something about your conviction that makes the power of God active in your life. 
that when you trust God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might, and you lean not to your own understanding, but you trust Him, that conviction, Lord, is what we need. We need convictions in our homes. We need convictions in our conversation. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't be vacillating back and forth. The world, your world is looking for somebody that's consistent. That's consistent. The Word of God is consistent. It's the only thing I know that's It doesn't change. And I'm telling you that wherever you have found yourself, trust God. Release it to God. Release it to God. And I promise you, God will take care of the matter. He will take care of the matter. And you won't even know what happened, how it happened. But He'll take care of the matter. Have conviction. Amen. You received that word on this morning? Amen. Amen. Somebody say, no counterfeit. No counterfeit. No counterfeit. This week, I'm not accepting no counterfeit. No counterfeit this week. Father, right now, Father God, we come before you right now, Father God, knowing that your word is alive and well, active like a two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit, Lord. Right now, Father God, we pray that your word was able to do just that on this morning, Lord. Now, Father God, you know where your people are at, Lord. And you know that this is not a popular subject matter to talk about. But Lord, I'm coming against the enemies of darkness right now that will prevent the light of your word penetrating the heart of your sons and daughters. That this word called conviction will begin to live and resonate in us, Lord, like never before, Lord. Take up residence in our life. For your word is the only thing that the Holy Spirit has to convict us, Lord, when we need to be convicted in different areas of our life, Lord. So, Lord, I pray right now that as we hear your word, we become more and more like you in your image and in your likeness, Lord. Now, Lord, we know that the enemy is always on his job. His job is to steal, kill, and destroy. I pray right now for a hedge of protection around that word that was sold sold into the hearts of your people. Let the enemy not come and steal it and take it and rob them, Father God, of the rich word of this hour, Lord. Let them build up strong conviction that will come core values for them, Lord. Now, Lord, there may be somebody in here who don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior. If you're here right now and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, Just slip your hands up right where you're at, and I'm going to pray a prayer of salvation over your life. If that's you, all over the house, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, just slip your hands right where you're at, and we're going to pray for you so that you can know that you belong to the family of God. Amen. 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 But we thank God for a safe house. Amen. We thank God for a safe house. Let's stand, family. Heavenly Father, I thank you right now, Father God, for these your people, Father God, who sit underneath your word today. Let it be a life-changing word, Father God. Let them be an example to the world, to the world, to the world that they live in, Lord, and the people that they do life with, Father God. Now, Father God, though we may be leaving this place, we know we will never leave your presence. Now, Father God, cover them and protect them. Give them an open heaven over their lives cause them to walk through those of favor that's already been preordained for them, Father God. And we thank you for depositing into them wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We love you.